Thank you, Rochelle. Um, I'd really like to thank the Prostate Cancer um, Support Canada, as well as the Prostate Cancer Foundation of BC for inviting me and the support group members across Canada that um, are interested in, in hearing me speak and have turned up today. So thank you very much. Um, Rochelle, if I'm, am I able to share my screen? Yep. Thank you. Okie dokie, I'm just gonna minimize you all for me and put this in display view. Okay, so um, I called the talk today, Diagnostics and Therapeutics for Prostate Cancer, an update. And you've, you've all seen my bio, but I'd like to explain a little bit how I got here. Um, about seven years ago, uh, I heard a talk from Dr. Michael Cox from the Prostate Cancer Center at Vancouver General Hospital, and uh, he's a urology professor at UBC. And I asked him some questions about the field, and he said, no, we don't do that. Um, so I started, we started up a collaboration, and, and that's been really amazing. Um, the Prostate Cancer Foundation of BC Grant and Fellowship Committee invited me on, and I've been on and off. Um, I obviously can't serve if one of my own graduate students or postdocs is applying. Um, and through that, I've been hugely, hugely appreciative of the patient advocates that sit on that committee, um, especially Mark White. Um, he's been on, on the committee for years, and I've learned so much from him. And also the dedication of Leah LaRiviere and Rochelle Green and other members of the PCFBC board. Um, you couldn't find a more dedicated set of people. My, my postdoc fellow, Alex Smith, um, this is a little bit of a conflict of interest statement. He did receive salary support from PCFBC in his last year. So that's 2019 to 2020 um, to study a novel pathway of prostate cancer drug targeting. Um, and I am pleased to report back to everybody that due in part to his excellence, which was supported by the Prostate Cancer Foundation BC, he secured a faculty position in January, 2021 at UBC. Um, I've also been invited to talk to uh, PCFBC support groups around the Greater Vancouver area, um, some of them more than once, including Surrey, White Rock, Burnaby and Port Coquitlam. Um, and in our home, these are known as my guys. Um, and uh, what I realized is they are, everybody understands the process of this disease, but I'm not sure that everybody gets enough information about the drugs. And if I can help even just one drug or one piece of information that's kind of I really like doing that and I really like making it understandable so I'm here and um, thanks for having me so an overview of the talk um, I'm going to talk about causes of prostate cancer there's some new information that's come through um, it's not complete yet but it does help us moving forward um, I'm going to talk about screening and diagnosis what's currently done and then non-drug interventions the current drug landscape the clinical trial landscape and some emerging therapies um, so the, the talk will be about 40 to 45 minutes. So we don't know the exact cause of prostate cancer. Uh, people with one or more risk factors may never get prostate cancer, and others who get this cancer may have few or no risk factors. They're not well defined, but we know the following are applicable. Age. So risk increases rapidly after 50, and two-thirds of prostate cancers are found in men over 65. Um, ethnicity and geography, I'm going to talk about these together because you'll see some asterisks here, um, occurs more often in African-American men and is more fatal in North America. And in terms of geography, prostate cancer is more rare in Asia, Africa and South America and more common in North America, UK and Europe. So there seems to be a discrepancy in there. If people of African-American descent have more prostate cancer and it's more fatal, but we don't see it in Africa, what's going on? Can it possibly be genetic? We think the answer is, is multiple here. It can be genetic, but it can be environmental. Secondly, we find that um, African-American men are less likely to be screened in North America. And so by time they get caught, they have, um, by time they get caught, they have uh, quite different uh, characteristics of the disease. It's usually more advanced. Secondly, Asia, Africa, and South America do not screen as well as North America, the UK, and Europe. So if you screen, you're going to find something. Um, I have a question from the chat. Is it possible that a virus could cause prostate cancer? And I can tell you, it's always possible, but that's been checked multiple, multiple, multiple times, and nobody's found any evidence. So yes, human papillomavirus causes um, cancer, cervical cancer, particularly in women. Um, there may be a virus out there we don't know about. I, I think I feel a bit silly saying that, given what we've all lived through for the last 20 months. Um, but as far as we can tell right now, it, it's not viral. Um, next slide. Um, family history, and this is an interesting one. There seems to be a hereditary element and it runs in families, but the precise genetics are not tracked yet. Um, there's a, a study currently going on in the UK called the barcode study. It's got 300 men and they're genetically profiling it. 
I've given you the, the National Trial Centre number. You can look it up if you want. And I have a link to where to look it up later in the talk. Um, and we expect that to be finished in about 18 months and it will provide greater insights. We know prostate cancer is associated with smoking. Um, I've got a slightly sarcastic always in there. Um, smoking is associated with almost all cancers we know of. Um, it's literally the carcinogens that you're breathing in. And finally, obesity. Obese men with prostate cancer may be more likely to have advanced disease that is more difficult to treat. Again, this is difficult. Um, obesity is also associated with um, lower socioeconomic um, status. And so it may be that these people aren't accessing screening or aren't accessing health care. Um, so screening, um, you probably know more about this than me, but the current recommendation is that men have a discussion with their healthcare provider about when to be screened for prostate cancer. It usually includes a blood test for PSA and or a digital exam. And um, this discussion should take place between 40 and 45 years of age for men at higher risk. So example, African-American men or at the age of 50 and older for average risk. Diagnosis is by biopsy and pathologists categorize using the Gleason scoring system with a grade of one to five. And then they take the two largest areas of the biopsy and add them together. Gleason scores of six or less are often termed well differentiated or low grade. That's what you want. You want the lowest number you can. Uh, seven are moderately differentiated or intermediate grade and eight to 10 poorly differentiated or high grade. So there's non-drug treatments and I'm sure you all know about active surveillance, which is used to be called watchful waiting. It's become more common since the diagnosis of early stage prostate cancer has increased. And the reason that early stage prostate cancer is diagnosed more commonly is because we have increased screening, increased awareness of this as a disease in the last 15 to 20 years, and the development of PSA as a biomarker. And I do want to add that we all know that PSA is not a perfect biomarker, but it's done pretty well in terms of earlier and earlier detection. Um, other non-drug treatments include external beam radiation therapy, which delivers a curative dose of radiation to the prostate, but it is a very high dose radiation. Um, so then we have intensity modulated radiation therapy. It achieves higher prostate radiation dose, but less to the surrounding tissue. Um, I have a question in the chat. Does the biopsy needle spread cancer? Almost certainly not. Um, brachytherapy low dose radioactive sources into the prostatic tissue via needles with little tiny rice sized seeds or wires under the skin. Um, and this can be really, really effective. And the idea of low dose radiation is, is very attractive to people um, because as we all know, if radiation is high dose or it spreads throughout the body, it can be very dangerous. This one's interesting to me, um, high intensity focused ultrasound or HIFU. Um, it kills the prostate tissue using heat and cavitation. So cavitation is a word for mechanical disruption. You literally shake the cells to death. Um, it's an option for men with low risk prostate cancer. And in one recent study um, published in 2020, patients who were negative for HIFU for prostate cancer, the five year follow-up showed an 81% negative biopsy rate. So it seems if we catch it early and we use this sort of slightly novel technology, it works really well. Um, there are two other types. These are less, uh, cryotherapy is less commonly used. Uh, surgical intervention involves freezing and he reheating the prostate gland to kill cancer cells. And then finally, if we really, really need to do this, we go in for a rad radical prostatectomy, which removes the entire prostate gland and the seminal vesicles. Um, so those are, those are non-drug interventions. Um, and they all have their benefits and drawbacks. Um, I'm primarily here, I wanted to talk to you more about um, drugs and immunotherapies. So I just wanted to show you this diagram about how prostate cancer grows. And I want to point out that this is not the testes, okay? This is the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. They sit at the base of the skull and their job in the base of the, of the brain. And their, their job is to secrete these two hormones into the blood. And these two hormones stim stimulate the testes um, and the adrenal gland. Now what those two, the testes and the adrenal gland do is they produce progesterone. Progesterone works on the prostate gland and it can start enlarging it, um, but testosterone is what is the real, the really bad actor here. So what you see in this last bottom slide on the right hand side is you see the antigen receptor AR and the enlarged prostate, which is being pushed and pushed and pushed by testosterone. So testosterone is anabolic. It's a bit like bodybuilders or professional athletes that will increase their testosterone levels to try and build muscle. Well, it's also going to increase the size of your prostate. So androgen deprivation therapies is the current standard of care. And the goal is to reduce the level of male hormones. So 
Um, we have a pair here that work um, on the uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis. Um, so there's LHRH and uh, GnRH agonists. So what they do is Degorelix is the LHRH one and mostly luprolide and gozzarellin are used for the GnRH. So let me show you where that works. Down here, okay? Their job is to stop the hypothalamus and the pituitary in the brain stimulating the testes and also the adrenal gland. Um, and they work pretty well. They have some reasonably, um, reasonably unpleasant side effects at times. And often the, the oncologist or the urologist might have to move you around a little bit on them, um, but they work pretty well to prevent this initiation kind of of the cascade. Then you have your anti-androgens. Um, these are also androgen deprivation therapy. Um, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor finasteride is very good at blocking the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone in the prostate. Um, and the CYP17 inhibitor abiraterone um, it inhibits CYP17, which is an enzyme needed to make androgens everywhere. It makes it in the testes, it makes it in the adrenals, and it makes it in the tumor. So abiraterone is working at multiple places to try and stop making these, these androgens. So where that works here in the cascade, it stops here. It stops the progesterone conversion to testosterone. It also stops the testosterone conversion to dihydrotestosterone or other metabolites that enlarge this prostate. And then we have androgen receptor blockers. So the first generation of these blockers were flutamide, bicalutamide, and nilutamide. Um, they still exist and they still are occasionally used, but they've been succeeded by second generation compounds, enzalutamide and apalutamide. They are improved AR blockers, so they bind to the androgen receptor better. They stop it from doing its job, which is what we want them to do. Stop it from the steroid signaling that grows the tumor. Um, one thing that is really unfortunate is that we know that when prostate cancer progresses, the tumors mutate that androgen receptor and they become androgen insensitive. Uh, and, and then we have other processes going on in the tumors and in the prostate that are driving the cancer that are not necessarily what these androgen deprivation therapy drugs target. So these last ones, this is where they work right down here in the prostate, they also work back here. Okay, so they're working at places where the androgen receptor exists. So if that happens and your ADT is not working anymore, you usually move forward to chemotherapy. And um, the two, the, the class of drugs that is um, used primarily for chemotherapy in, in prostate cancer are called taxanes. And for those of you that are interested, um, they were originally a natural product that are derived from the bark of a yew tree, uh, but we make them synthetically now and we make them very pure. So docetaxel is the first line. Um, and recent evidence suggests that every three weeks with prednisone, um, prednisone dampens down your immune system. It's a, stero it's a corticosteroid. Um, it's found to be um, superior than the usual uh, original first line use, which was docetaxel and mitoxantrone. Mitoxantrone is a different type of chemotherapy that stops cells from dividing. If that doesn't work, or if you have experienced particularly nasty side effects, um, the next thing, the next drug in line is something called cabezataxel. It's still a taxane, um, but it's secondary treatment for advanced hormone refractory and prostate cancer. So if you've already been treated with docetaxel and you become resistant or your side effects are, are unacceptable, cabezataxel may be moved in. Um, the really unfortunate thing here is resistance to these two drugs is associated with res resistance to other androgen receptor pathway drugs. So when we start seeing resistance to these, we get worried because we're running out of guns in our arsenal. Um, these are the new um, chemotherapy combinations in trial. And I think what you'll see, which is really interesting, is you see these taxanes, docetaxel and cabezataxel, and they're being put in together with the abiraterone um, and enzalutamide. So put in together with the androgen deprivation therapy. Um, these clinical trials, just so that you know, they're either named by an acronym, Abido, Chiron, Abby, Cabezi, um, or they have an NCT number. You can search this number um, in, the, in the National Clinical Trials database, and it will tell you all about it. Um, and again, I'll, I'll show you how to find that very shortly. So these, these therapeutic options are really interesting because instead of just hitting one part of the cancerous pathway, what they're doing is they're hitting multiple parts simultaneously. And so I think you can imagine it's better if you hit one part and you somehow get evasion, then the rest of the pathway will happen. But if you hit two parts, then you're kind of simultaneously shutting down a pathway in two different places, so you're less likely to get evasion. 
Um, I briefly want to mention denosumab. It's not a well-known drug. Um, and please note, I'm using generic names. These all have trade names as well. As a professional pharmacologist, we don't promote, promote trade names. We promote generic names um, because trade names belong to companies. Um, so denosumab, uh, anything with MAB on it is an antibody. This one's a monoclonal one and it targets a protein um, involved in cancer bone destruction called rank L. Okay, so what it does is it, it prevents not only the growth of bone cells, but it also prevents the metastases from um, breaking down the sides of the cells. So bone cells are called chondrocytes and they're really stiff and straight like this. And what happens is as the cancer invades, it starts to push and break them down. And part of the, what it does is it uses rank L to do that. And denosumab just sits in there and says, no, you can't do that. This bone cell will remain straight and hard. Um, it was approved in 2010, and it's, it's a very unusual approval from FDA, this one. It's, it's approved to prevent skeletal-related events in any cancer patient with a bone metastasis. And that's because it will help keep those bone cells straight, no matter what metastasis you have in the bone. So denosumab, it's also, um, because it's a monoclonal antibody, it's also quite expensive. So those are the existing landscapes, and I didn't want to spend a long time talking about the existing landscape because I'm aware that most of you probably know everything I've already said. But what I wanted to talk about is some new players. Um, they, and they have different mechanisms of action. So um, clinical trials that are underway, um, the most useful database is the National Clinical Trials Registry, it's called NCT. It's hosted in the United States of America, um, but it contains registered trials worldwide. Um, as of uh, three o'clock this afternoon, because I checked, it currently reports 5,240 ongoing trials for any phase of prostate cancer in Canada. And if you click on this link, you will go to all of them and you can have a look. Um, the Ontario Cancer Trials Registry reports across Canada only. And as of three o'clock this afternoon, they're reporting 60 ongoing clinical trials in any phase for prostate cancer. So any phase means some of these trials are fully enrolled and progressing, so they're not taking any more people in. And some of them are still enrolling patients. And you, you know, it's up to you, your family, and your oncologist. Um, but they, these are options for people. So how do we design drugs would be a question that I wanted to sort of cover. The ideal drug is small. So we're talking like very, very small because it needs to get in and out of the body. It needs to be a little bit fat soluble, and it needs to be a little bit water soluble. Um, I'll tell you right now, like the chemists, they don't like pharmacologists because we, we say, yeah, that molecule looks great. It looks like it's going to work against cancer, but it's not fat soluble enough. Can you just make it a bit more fat soluble? And then we go back to them. I say, it's too fat soluble. It's not staying in the body long enough. So this balancing act is really, it's a dance that we have with, um, the pharmacologists and the, the pharmaceutical chemists that build these drugs. Um, we want a drug that's highly selective which means it has less side effects. We don't use the word specific in the pharmacology field because we know no drug is specific. Um, and for those of you that are, are aware of um, the famous quote from Paracelsus, the dose makes the poison. And what that means is if you increase the concentration and increase the concentration and increase the concentration, eventually you will have an effect not where you want it to be. So, and you will have a side effect or a toxicity. So the more selective a drug is, the smaller the concentration you can use and the less likely to get side effects. And the last one is purely practical. We need it to have a medium residence time in the body. So about 12 to 24 hours. And that relates to dosing. It's not practical to ask somebody to take a drug, especially by mouth every two hours. Um, so we're looking for a set of chemical and biological characteristics that mean that if you're gonna take something orally, then you're gonna to have to take it every six hours or 12 hours. We also think if you're gonna to have to have an infusion or an IV injection, we only want you to be in the clinic for a couple of hours having that, and then it will last in the body for plenty of time. And I've got a little bit of a, of a double asterisk up here, and I did want to talk to you about this. The newer antibody therapies break some of these rules. So antibodies are really, really big. They're not small like drug molecules, but they are highly, highly selective. So most of them require IV infusion for administration, and that's like a, that's an inpatient or, a, or an infusion center thing. They will likely never be given orally. Um, we are, I mean, never say never. Uh, the people that do these types of formulations are designing packaging to try and get them in, um, but we're not there yet. 
Um, and technically, just for the point of fact, antibodies or the, what we call the MABs, MABs, they're not drugs, but they are therapeutics. Um, so they have immune-like properties, but they also have drug-like properties, and we exploit the drug-like and the immune-like properties. Um, so they belong to both us as pharmacologists, but they also belong to the immunologists. So in general, what trials are going on? I can tell you that the vast majority of trials in prostate cancer are not for new drugs. Um, they're exploring combinations of existing drugs. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a few of those, but I'm also going to talk to you about some of the, the, the standout stuff, that is the new drugs that are novel molecules. Um, so for early stage prostate cancer, most drugs either block androgens from being made or block them from doing their job. So namely that's ADT. And that's because those androgens drive the prostate growth and especially the inappropriate growth of the cancer. Um, for mid-stage or late-stage prostate cancer, that is resistant. Uh, I have a question in the chat. Oh, that's a really good question. So um, somebody would like to know, do the clinical trials cure prostate cancer or do they just prolong, prolong it or delay it? Um, I will tell you that if you're in a clinical trial, the likelihood of the drug working is very, very low. And people should be told this going into, it doesn't matter what phase, phase one, two or three. Um, most drugs fail clinical trials. If the drug shows a therapeutic benefit in the middle of a clinical trial, they will likely stop the trial. And most commonly, they will give the drug for the remainder of the regimen uh, for free to the trial participants. Uh, and if it, if it shows amazing benefit, they'll also give it to the placebo arm. Uh, but that situation is very, very rare. So most people find when they come out of a clinical trial, they've had a little bit of benefit or no benefit whatsoever. However, if you catch a unicorn, you can go into a trial and come out and be, um, I wouldn't say cured, but I would say definitely that your prostate cancer has been delayed or is, is in remission. Okay. Um, so most of these mid to late stage prof, uh, trials are looking at combinations of which there's like there's thousands and thousands of combinations that we could put through. Um, so, and as I said earlier, good combinations might have two drugs that hit a different part of the cell growth. Um, and the other thing that's really interesting is within each patient, oncologists and oncology boards, which is when the oncologists get together and discuss a case, they often use personalized combinations. So this is kind of cool. We've got the idea of um, investigating on a population level how these combinations might work. But we've also got the idea of personalized medicine where your physicians are working for you for a combination that works for you. Um, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, the newer approaches in the last 10 years have, have, have definitely harnessed the immune system. So that's called antibody-directed therapy. Um, and there are two general approaches. The first is to design an immune antibody to a protein that is particular to the tumor. So antibodies, they're, they're these amazing things. They home in and they have, it's called an epitope. And so basically they have a shape that they only recognize that shape and they bind to it really, really hard and then they destroy it. And so if you can find something that is only, that shape is only shown on the tumor, the, these antibodies, are, they're, they're real destroyers. They come in and, and they work really well. Um, the problem is if suddenly the tumor stops having that shape on it, which can happen, it can, it's called mutation. Um, and so the antibody directed therapies that work on in destroying these, um, they either tend to cause complete remission or they, they work for a while and then they stop working because tumors are horrible little things. They're really good at taking away the things that we design against them. The other thing that they do is they block immune molecules so the body doesn't attack itself. And that's really important. There's times with cancer, which is, is a very inflammatory state um, where the body can start attacking itself and the antibodies um, can calm that down. So there is a question in the chat. Um, I can't offer you medical advice. But I can say that I wouldn't be messing around with taking testosterone if I had prostate cancer. That's just a personal statement. Oops, I'm going back. So I'm going to talk about some of these um, unusual molecules that are in development um, that you might be hearing about soon. They are in various stages of um, clinical trials, um, but there's hope for what's coming down the track because we know that when androgen deprivation therapy fails, you then start on taxane chemotherapy. And then we know that if it moves to the bone, you start on a different. But what about if we had something else out there that you could move on to? So these are the ideas of, of the something else's. So um, tasquinamod is interesting. It's both preclinical and clinical trials. So it's still being studied in the lab, but they've started in the very early phases of, of clinical trials. 
It's been most studied in prostate cancer, but it may be good for all solid tumors. And it's a drug, it's a small molecule, it's an actual drug that controls immunosuppression and it prevents the development of blood vessels in the tumor. The way it does it is through a protein called S100A9 because scientists are very boring when it comes to naming proteins. Um, but the idea here is if you can't build blood vessels in the tumor, you can't get oxygen and the tumor starves. Again, with the immunosuppression, it's stopping the body from attacking itself. Um, the next ones are, this one's interesting. Um, so phosphoinositol 3 kinase inhibitor, which we don't use, we call it PI3K. Um, these signaling pathways basically provide the tumor with growth and survival factors. So PI3K is not something you want to be really active in your tumor because it's gonna be growing and, and helping not just progression, but metastasis. And the idea is to stop that PI3K working. Okay, it's an enzyme and we wanna stop it working want to stop it making food for the tumor. Um, the really unfortunate thing about PI3K, we thought it would be like a wonder drug, uh, and they were really, really good in animal models and preclinical animal models, including some quite large animals, um, such as mini pigs. However, the first in human trials of them as a lone agent, the response was limited and they stopped the trials early, not because it was great, but because they were like, no, this isn't working. So what they've done is they've repurposed this, and there are currently several clinical trials underway um, in all phases, uh, and multiple molecules primarily combining PI3K with ADT, again with this idea, can I block different pathways and have a double whammy effect? Uh, the DNA damage response inhibitors, there's multiple of these, I'm going to talk about one later on, but um, where there's multiple and the trials are very early, I haven't pointed you towards a trial of giving you a name because like, it, like I said, most of the trials fail, but um, this is an idea that when tumors grow and divide very rapidly, the fidelity of the copying of the DNA is not good. So basically, if you don't copy your DNA properly, you end up with all sorts of broken parts of the cell and the cell dies. So tumors are really good at, at they don't copy it well, but then they fix their DNA. Now these new drugs, they block the DNA fixing um, response. So basically it forces the tumor cell to have these broken DNA bits. And then what happens is the tumor cell dies because it can't repair itself and it can't use its DNA to make food and it can't use any of its machinery. So these guys work way down in the level of the nucleus inside the cell and they're effectively forcing the tumor cells to die because they can't replicate properly. Um, there are multiple of these compounds in multiple clinical trials, um, and we'll talk about one later on. And they're, they're looked at in terms of single agents. Could it be used by itself, or could it be double whammied in with the ADT drugs in combination? Yes, there's a, that's a really clever question. Thank you very much. Is, if cancer is caused by defective DNA, can gene editing be used to repair the defective DNA in cancer? Uh, yeah, that's the next, I would say that's the, the next frontier. So gene editing, you've probably heard of CRISPR-Cas9. I'm going the wrong way. Um, hey, go back. Uh, you've probably heard of CRISPR-Cas9. Um, and that is a question is, can we import those gene editing tools into cancer and either really mess up the DNA so that the tumors can't replicate at all and they go away or fix the DNA in such a way that they are not cancerous anymore? Uh, that is like way early stage, but it's the sort of thing that, um, cancer biologists are actually starting to try. So um, I do want to talk about nivolumab. I have really, really great hopes for this one. It's a, what we call a PD-1 inhibitor. Um, it's used um, as a single agent and it's been approved in all of these other cancers. It's approved for melanoma, lung cancer, mesothelioma, renal cell carcinoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, head and neck cancer, neurothelial, colon, so on and so on. It's currently only in trials for prostate cancer. It hasn't been officially approved. So what um, nivolumab is, again, you hear MAB, it means it's an antibody. Um, it's a specialized humanized antibody that's given by infusion. So you have to sit down and wait for a couple of hours while it's given to you. And it activates T cell immunity. So T cells are pretty cool. T cells are immune cells that kill cancer cells. And the target on the cancer cells is a protein called PDL1. And evolutionarily, T cells have just have evolved. They see this PDL1. And it's like, it's like pulling a machine gun trigger. And, and if they can see it, they go after it. So what we do is we prime this antibody therapy, um, this therapeutic, to go after the PDL1. 
Uh, phase three trials are underway. Like I said, we have hope, and these are the registration numbers of the two um, biggest and most advanced trials. And if for no other reason, because it's so active against all of these other cancers, there, there is some enthusiasm in, in the community um, around, around these, these drugs or the, this PD, PD-1 inhibitor. Um, I did promise to also talk about diagnostics as well. Um, this one is a, is a radionuclide, but it's not a diagnostic. It's called targeted alpha therapy. So radium-223, so all the way back to Marie Curie, who uh, discovered radium, um, it, what it does is it's given intravenously. And in the body, the body sees it as calcium because it's got a very strange radioactive signature. So what it does is it takes it up into bone really, really rapidly. So when you put it in, and you can actually, if you happen to have someone in a PET scanner, which look, that can read radiation pretty well, you can actually see in the PET scan it coming out of the blood and homing into the bone really fast. So what it does is once it settles in the bone, it releases its radiation. And that radiation kills the metastases. It kills the tumor cells. Um, clinical trials, are, it, it has been used, what we call off-label at late stage metastasis only, but clinical trials are underway to see if this might be useful in combination with androgen dep deprivation therapy or chemotherapy, so those are the taxanes, or cell T. Um, the other one that's um, of, of, of super interest at the moment, and the idea that um, I think you might like, is this idea of radio diagnostics. So a person asked me earlier, does the use of a biopsy needle spread the cancer? And I said, no, it doesn't, but biopsy is not pleasant. Uh, and one of the, the things that, this one's probably going to be approved very soon, gallium-63 is a radionuclide being tested as a diagnostics tool for either PET scanning, so positron emission tomography, or MRI scanning. The trial number is there. Um, and the idea is to guide diagnostics without biopsy, so non-invasive scanning. And at the moment, that particular trial, that NCT number, um, is to determine whether prostate cancer tumors are responsive to HIFU therapy. So instead of biopsying to see if the Gleason score changes or what they want to do is they want to say, hey, you know, we can, you can use this gallium-63, we can do an external scan of the body, and we can tell how well um, these tumors are shrinking or what's, what's going on with them. Mm. Um, this one's been around for a while, PSMA, you've probably heard of it, a prostate-specific membrane antigen. Um, it's a protein found on prostate cancer cells only on the outer membrane. So that's a good thing at best, right? Because all you have to do is get it from the blood to the outer membrane of the prostate cancer cells. Um, it is already used in diagnostic imaging um, using PET scans, so it can be non-invasive. And it's recognized by two different radionuclides, so gallium-68 and fluorine-18. And this has already been approved. But... Um, there's a, a new idea out there and, and, and the preclinical and just the very early phases, like phase two of clinical development and clinical trials. And what's happened is instead of just using it to image the, the prostate and image the tumor, some clever clogs is, has engineered these antibodies that bind to PSMA and attack the tumor cells. And again, whenever you hear about antibodies, we're looking for something that it will just bind to and home in on like a machine gun, because that's what antibodies do. Um, so this, this is kind of interesting because we've got something that's being used as a diagnostic and approved, but with the antibody approach instead of the radioactive approach, it may be possible to use it as a therapeutic. And lastly, um, I have a question in the chat. Uh, so there's a question that it's been noted that PMSA scans don't bind to some types of cancer and other alternatives. Um, at the moment, we're not we're not super. Um, far through on the new radionuclides, yeah. um, and sometimes we do get a we do get a um, a result where it, it doesn't work. Um, in which case, probably the the default position is either a biopsy um, or the gallium sixty three. Actually, there's a different radionuclide, um, but at the moment we're just in, in the infancy of scanning and using radioactivity uh, for diagnostics instead of actually putting a needle in. That's the answer. So I'm going to finish with tele, um, teleglanosat and telazoparib, and I, I, I challenge you to say those two fast five times over. Um, oh. Telegamosat blocks an enzyme called glutaminase, and that's overproduced by some tumors. And telazoparib, and I told you, is one of those DNA repair blockers I was telling you about. So there's a phase two clinical trial underway, and it's for MCRPC, right? Metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. So I know you don't need me to tell you this, but I'm just going to emphasize it that once you get to CRPC, 
we are running out of, of guns in the arsenal and we really not need to start trying to you know, work on this. Um, so just to let you know that um, telaglandostat and the combination of telaglandostat and telazoparib are not approved for the treatment of any disease. Um, but telazoparib is approved for advanced breast cancer where there are certain genetic mutations. And so you might've heard of those, those are the BRCA genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, if you have a, if you're a woman and you have a um, familial uh, history, particularly in a close relative of um, ovarian or breast cancer, and you have both of those mutations, uh, you will be advised to have a preemptive um, um, breast surgery, basically. And you may even be advised to have preemptive uh, ovarian removal. So they are really um, reliable and nasty markers of, um, of metastasis and of cancer. We don't know how that translates to prostate cancer. But um, with the, the combination of the glutaminase, which is commonly expressed in some prostate cancers, not all, um, and the DNA repair blocker, which should just work basically on can any cancer mechanism, really. Um, the phase two, so this one made it through phase one clinical trials, um, and the phase two trial is underway. So um, I'm aware that I've done that really fast, um, because I know that you guys know what prostate cancer progression looks like. What I wanted to do was highlight some really um, important new things that are coming through and the idea that they are mostly combinations because hitting two places is better than hitting one but there are some really novel approaches where there may only be a single um, isoform and I particularly think the PD-1 inhibitor is, is I think if it's so good for so many other cancers I don't see why it wouldn't work for prostate cancer but that's a, those are famous last words I don't see why it wouldn't is, is you know so um, some thoughts for the future we all know that prostate cancer is one of the most common cancers. Okay. It's also one of the most commonly studied, and, and I think maybe I've made a case that there are new avenues emerging. Um, one thing that's uh, different from a lot of other fields, so I, I study drugs in a lot of fields because my, my basic um, expertise is the metabolism of the drugs and the pharmacokinetics. Pharmacokinetics means how do they get around the body? How do they target things? So that can be applied to multiple different fields, and I would say that um, in, in all cancer, but specifically in prostate cancer, survivorship is, is, is a priority. Um, curative, yep, we always strive for that, but survivorship is a priority. Um, I hope that I've highlighted that there is hope um, with what's coming through. And people like me, there's, there's not a huge number of us in Canada or even worldwide, um, and, and we know about the drugs. But I would say keep talking to your urologist and keep talking to your oncologist and keep asking them, you know, is, what's the best for me? What do you think? Can we talk about it? And I know you're going to say, I only get 10 minutes with my oncologist or 12 minutes. But getting across that idea of shared care, a shared care, and getting across the idea that, you know, you guys are all really smart and you're really interested. And I don't see why they can't tell you about it. Um, so, with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for your time. Questions are welcome. I know I've had a few in the chat, but um, I'd really like to hear your thoughts, um, and I'm happy to answer questions for as long as you would like me to. So thank you. And I will stop sharing my screen. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm having some technical difficulties here, so I'm joined on my phone. <laughs> but um, I see that there's a question here in the chat. Thank you, um, yeah, so Gary said, your talk suggests that ADT will cure mm -hmm. prostate cancer. Whereas everything I've read says ADT will only control prostate cancer, not cure. What about side effects? Yeah, no, ADT will not cure cancer. And that's not what I was suggesting at all. And um, the bit where I said, uh, after a certain amount, you're welcome, Rhys. Um, after a certain amount of time, um, ADT will always fail because the prostate cancer will mutate its androgen receptor. Um, and you're very welcome. Um, so I'm responding to stuff in the chat, by the way. Um, so ADT will fail and, and then you will get progression. And how long it takes to fail, how long is a piece of string, right? Um, so I feel like what's coming through for, for post-androgen uh, receptor ther therapy or post-androgen deprivation therapy, maybe we introduce it earlier because we're waiting for taxanes until it has failed and then you're in a really serious situation. So if we maybe can introduce it earlier, then we will maybe have more success. But the flip side of that is we still need to develop agents for 
castration resistant prostate cancer. And if we can do that and send it backwards and send you into remission from CRPC, that would be the holy grail. That would be something we were really looking for. So there is the combination approach and there is the single agent approach. Um, as for side effects, I would say um, traditional chemotherapy agents, including taxanes, if they don't kill the, the cancer, they kill the patient. And we know this, they basically work on high levels of toxicity. And so the side effects are terrible. You get really, really sick. Um, however, if we can, and that's why these antibody approaches are, are so ascendant because they're so much more specific. They like really go after the, the tumor. You're not systemically making somebody like toxic so that you can also kill the tumor. So the new approaches are much more selective and there should be fewer side effects. Um, nothing's without risk and nothing's without side effects. For example, if you get given antibodies by infusion, there can be infusion injury, um, or you can have an infusion reaction. So, um, but I feel like the, as we're moving forward, the new agents are more selective, less toxic, and less side effects. Makes sense. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Not seeing any in the chat, but um, I have one in the chat. Okay, perfect. I have a question. I'm, I'm just going to finish reading this in the chat and answer it. Um, so the, the, there are questions about around radical prostatectomies and what the side effects are like. I, I wonder, and this is, this is me speculating, but it is part of my knowledge of the field, is if we won't develop something that's a little bit like hormone replacement therapy for women, for men that have had radical prostatectomies, and we're certainly not there yet because we can't simply go in and, and add that hormone replacement therapy because you'll, you may reactivate the cancer because that's exactly what those hormones are doing. Um, but I would think that working towards that for survivors that have had serious side effects um, is an area, it's not a huge area of expansion right now. Um, it's more of an area that like academic researchers are looking at rather than the drug companies. So I hope that answers the question. Um, Nick, did somebody else have a question? I have a question. Um, you're presently in Vancouver uh, and appear to know a whole bunch more about prostate cancer and the drugs than my doctor does, who has essentially given up on me. Um, I've been dealing with this nightmare since 2011, and every treatment I've had, including the prostatectomy, was an absolute utter failure. Uh, I got a heart attack with bicalutamide. I got almost a heart attack with enzalutamide, and now I'm on abiraterone and prednisone. I have no idea how long that's going to continue. Um, and they are very reluctant, if not uh, almost rude, to get rid of me out of the hospital and just plain don't answer or get interested in any sort of a new treatment or curative arrangement. Um, I guess in the bottom line question is, uh, if you're in Vancouver, do you accept patients from Alberta? I'm not a medical doctor and I, I, I don't, I don't treat people clinically. I work with medical doctors and I work with drug development teams, including drug companies, um, which is how I know so much about this. I can tell you that Vancouver has excellent oncology. The, the Prostate Cancer Center is great. Um, and you should reach out to your oncologist and ask him if it's possible to, if, it, if it's possible. I don't know the answer to that. Um, but the, the short answer is I, I don't see patients myself. I work, with, I work with the physicians and I also work with the drug companies. Thank you. In my case, I'm going to have to go to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester to see if I can get any new information as the doctors in Alberta just plain don't care. Uh, they must be overwhelmed with the number of patients. And since I've been running around for 10 years with this nightmare, they tend to just say, well, uh, you had a good life. Enjoy what you've got left. And that really uh, is not what I want to hear. I'm not prepared to go down without a fight. I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. And I, I I despair of medical professionals not even having conversations with patients. And it's, I know it happens. Um, I will disclose to this group that I am a 20 year survivor of liver cancer that I had when I was 22 to 23. Um, so now you know I'm 43. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I know what it looks like looking down that tunnel. And I know what it looks like not to go down without a fight because most people that have cholangioma don't make it. And I was lucky enough to have an internist that um, I was lucky enough to have an internist that explained it to me. I was in the PhD program in pharmacology at the time, so 
I don't know if that made a difference, but it shouldn't. And I'm really, really sorry for your position. The Mayo Clinic are outstanding. I have several colleagues there and I hope that they can help you. I have a couple more questions in the chat. Uh, Laurent Lamab, yeah, CCR5 receptor. So my PhD is actually in um, transplacental HIV transfer to the fetus and preventing that from happening. And around about oh, 1999, 2000, um, CCR5 was investigated to prevent HIV from entering cells. And it turns out to be a really, really versatile little guy. Um, but Laurent Lamab um, doesn't have a perfect binding and uh, it looks really promising from the trial. But um, there are, yeah, I actually can't say anything more than that about Laurent Lamab, and that's the reason I didn't talk to you about it. Um, so uh, thank you for the information. It, that's, you are correct. Um, and thank you for sharing um, to the person that, that shared my experience. Um, so I have a question for the group then. Um, somebody has just told me that it's really hard to find post prostatectomy support, and it's really hard to find people that answer questions and the oncologists and things aren't interested. My question is, I've, I've got three questions because I tend to have multiple thoughts in my head at once. The first one is, is this because we're not talking to each other in ways that we understand? Like I understand sometimes somebody says something to you and what they're saying and what you're hearing is two different things. Is this because I know all the oncologists and neurologists that I know of are massively open overwhelmed they have 12 minutes or 15 minutes with the patients do you feel like there's not enough time or three are we as pharmacologists neurologists oncologists and uh, allied medical professionals just not reaching out with enough education does anybody care to comment on that um i'd like to make a comment uh, it, it seems in Alberta anyway, it seems that the uh, medical system is run by political people who think that they're spending too much money on older retired guys that get prostate cancer, and they just aren't front and center in the political scene, and they all know that they can go other places and get treatment in the U.S. or some other country. And it's been uh, our experience that with our present government, uh, and I guess even with the COVID-19 pandemic that showed up, uh, well, within a couple of weeks, we were able to come up with a vaccine that seemed to work, uh, at least for the short term. Yeah, we've been fighting prostate cancer for the past 60 years plus, and we haven't gotten anywhere. And it seems like there's uh, a need for a terrific amount more political influence to get people um, in, into the treatment mode. Plus, all of the old guard that's out here in Alberta, they just simply point blank say nothing will work. And anybody uses the word cure is basically run off. And there's only a few really, really good researchers recently that have been able to produce really good results that have changed the treatment scenario. But now they've all been turned over to COVID-19 research and dropped the prostate cancer research altogether. So um, in that particular case, doctors are normal. They have to see productivity. They have to see success and not constant failure. And if we're looking at a constant failure mode, guys, just say to heck with it. I'll go do something else that's going to give me satisfaction. Um, a surgeon does the operation, the patient gets better. Every time you talk to an oncologist, he knows he's talking to. Did I get stopped or something? No, I don't <laughs> think so. Sorry, 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 that was me. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Warren, thank you for your thoughts. I, I would like to make a comment about the, um, <laughs> I actually yeah, definitely yeah. would like to make a comment about the, uh, the COVID vaccines. Um, so we are living history. I teach graduate students and undergraduates and we tell them that the average drug takes um, 12 years to get to market and costs about $2 billion, right? Um, we got vaccines to, and prior to that, the fastest a vaccine had ever come um, to market was four years. That was for mums. Um, so I, I have never seen like, you know, it's like 20, 22 years in the field and I have never seen the public private partnerships we saw I've never seen the private-private partnerships we saw. When Pfizer and BioNTech got together, I was laughing with, my, my husband is also a pharmacologist, and I was like, Pfizer's just going to swallow BioNTech. There's no way they'll still exist in six months. But instead, they partnered, and they took the expertise from the company. Also, it's estimated that if you include the four major vaccines, so Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech, 
AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, or Janssen as it's called, if you put the four of them together, uh, it's estimated that the cost to develop them within that 18 months was three trillion US dollars. Trillion. We have never seen anything like that. Like I keep telling my graduate students, you guys are living history. I, like there's not even, there wasn't even the thought that we could do this. So I wouldn't use COVID vaccines as a benchmark because it's astonishing. It, it's it's aston it, it, I still can't get my head around it. But I would say that in refractory cancers like prostate, which they're slow growing and you get five year survivorship rates that are quite high if you want to use it that way. And I still don't think a five year survivorship rate is in any way acceptable. We should be looking curative. I think a little bit of complacency sets in and then, of course, you've got competition for the research and the healthcare dollar. And so if you've got a child with neuroblastoma or glioblastoma, and I don't think it should be competitive. I truly, truly don't. But at the end of the day, the healthcare dollars and the research dollars have to be spread out. So that I'm not making excuses because obviously I'm spending research, healthcare dollars and time and graduate students in prostate cancer. And, you know, survivorship's a thing, but curative is better. But I agree with you that you've got an oncologist that's got these refractory patients. And I guess oncologists are humans too. Um, okay, somebody's using trade names, but you still know what they are. Yeah, okay. Um, so I gave a talk to, I think it was Burnaby, um, and I talked about hot flashes. And sometimes they go away, and sometimes they don't. Um, in order to eliminate hot flashes, it's, a, it's actually that pituitary adrenal gland and how the hormones work on your, on your temperature raising and lowering system. Um, usually what it takes is, is rotating around until you find something. Um, I sincerely hope the venlafaxine works for you, but venlafaxine is not really designed for that. that. That's kind of a slightly off-label use. Um, but um, I would say keep talking to not just your oncologist, but your GP as well. Hello, uh, my name is David Trost. I'd like to comment on going back to your three questions about treatment by oncologists and doctors. Please do. Uh, uh, I've had the opportunity to be treated. I was originally treated in Ontario and then I moved to Vancouver. So I've been treated in both the Toronto area and the Vancouver area. Uh, I found the level of care was reasonable in both those areas. Uh, I had a very good urologist in Ontario, and I, had a, I have a, a good urologist here in Vancouver. So I think it's dependent on who you get. I find that my GP here has no knowledge, and I don't spend any time with him. But uh, the uh, urologist is, is excellent, and, and I agree with you. I think BC has a, a very good center for oncology and uh, they provide excellent support but you really have to look after yourself in a way if you want to learn more you just have to spend the time by going to seminars like this and it, it, it's dependent on yourself to go further yeah I mean I agree with you I, I just I think the Prostate Cancer Foundation across Canada and as well as in provinces do an, an amazing job with their support groups and putting on things like this for Prostate Cancer Awareness Month and finding people, you know, I was hoping you guys would enjoy the hearing about the new drugs and, but even just going over the old drugs and what their limitations are. And, you know, I wanted to keep it to 40, 45 minutes. So A, I don't bore you and give you a headache, but B, getting the most current and inf information across. Um, and I, so yeah, so Doug Pritchard said that it, it, PCA support groups have done a good job. Um, I'm always willing to have these conversations with people. Uh, I do not have a medical license. I will not offer medical advice, but I will explain the drugs to you until the cows come home. Um, and also I would say, I agree also with Doug, women have had better advocates for things like breast cancer and cervical cancer. But I would say the reason for that uh, goes back to the sixties and seventies with the feminism movement. And I think they just advocated for everything. Um, and, and, and uh, like, there isn't really a, a manism movement, <laughs> although there probably should be. Um, so foundations like Prostate Cancer Foundation, they, you know, they do advocate and they do the job, but breaking through at a federal level is impossible just about for anybody. Um, and so in this kind of a group, the education that goes on and the, also the, the, the support from everybody, 
think is really important, but to just keep pushing, I don't, just keep pushing. Does anybody else have any other questions? Oh, I have you one last question, <laughs> Sorry, was that Warren? Um, just one last comment. Um, 60 Minutes, the presentation on CBC on Sunday nights had a 20 minute presentation on the COVID-19 issue. And um, actually they apparently have a military project set up to make sure a virus never ever comes back into play into North America or the world anyway, uh, which opens up a whole new door of how it got developed in the first place. And they seem to be feeling strongly that it was a military weapon gone array. They didn't point any fingers. But it's well worth watching if you choose to look at the 60 minutes presentation. It's only 20 minutes uh, long. It was a week or the last week before that. So um, I'd like to give you a little bit of feedback on that. Um, so like I told you, I started in virus, hello. Antiviral, antiviral drugs. Um, oh, hello, Millie. All of the countries um, around the world that are effectively nuclear capable have bio or had bioweapons and chemical programs. And they have not necessarily shut them down to greater or lesser extents. And um, there's a Wikipedia page if you want to go and have a look. It's actually kind of amusing. It's actually not amusing because it's really scary. But um, most of the outbreaks that have happened have been through accident because it's really, really hard to work in biological level four labs and biological level three labs. And it's also really, really hard to keep those labs running properly. Um, there's such a thing as gain of function um, things where you basically take a genome and you start making it either more infectious or more whatever. And we know that those types of experiments can be done. We don't know if that was done. I can tell you, I've read the genome of the COVID virus. It doesn't look particularly, it's not synthetic. I can promise you that. I've read the genome of that virus. It is not synthetic because when humans make things synthetic, they tend to use a lot of repeats and it's too random, but that does not mean that there weren't gain of functions being done. Um, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, so I don't think it was released on purpose. And that's just a personal opinion. Um, but I can tell you that. So um, one of the most notorious ones was in Russia, they were working on anthrax and the, it was airborne anthrax. And two of the lab technicians put a couple of vials uncapped anthrax next to the ventilation system. And they killed a bunch of people in the local village. And that's just pure mistake. And they should never have had an external ventilation system in a class four lab and, 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 and. So I don't, don't claim to know what's going on with COVID, but I think there's a, there's a lot of different things that could have happened. And I wouldn't necessarily ascribe to, you know, ingenuity, which could be ascribed to pure stupidity and bad luck. <laughs> so um, that's just, that's, yeah. Um, I think Len Gross has his hand up. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. It's just, uh, Warren, I just, I just wanted to mention to you uh, that uh, if you speak to your GP and ask him if you can get a referral to the BC Cancer in Vancouver, and other people have been able to come from other provinces to Vancouver for treatment. So I see no reason why you shouldn't be able to do the same, but you probably won't get it through your, your urologist or oncologist, although you may, but generally speaking, it, it works best through your GP. Thank you. Um, Daryl, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, have you heard of any studies working working with uh, metformin and or statins in combination with these other drugs? Just speaking from heart problems, I know when I took my statins, um, I went through a thing of it was giving me leg problems, so I quit. But anyway, so that PSA was high. Two months later, I decided I was going to be taking it. So I was taking it for about a month and a half prior to the test and it dropped the PSA. And then I thought, well, is this actual or, or what? So I left it off again and the PSA went back up. And I know PSA can do that, but it was moving in, in stages of like right now, it's about uh, three and a quarter. And uh, it, was, it went down by two points and it only came back up by about one or something like that. Um, so, mechan uh, so mechanism of action, um, metformin and statins have two different mechanisms of actions. And um, I, I don't see how they would work on prostate cancer cells. Having said that, um, we quite often find that drugs that get repurposed, we, we know they work on, on X and then you go looking at it and you're like, it also works on Y and who knew? Um, metformin is the older of the drugs. Um, it's more commonly used in Europe than it is in North America. Um, but the statins 
um, the lipid lowering drugs, um, they have slightly different effects in between the drugs in the class. Um, and that suggests to us, actually I was just teaching about this on Tuesday, that suggests to us that there are slightly different mechanisms of, of the drugs in the class called statins that we don't necessarily understand yet. Now we know they all work to lower the lipids in a certain way, but each of those individual drugs in the class um, may actually have other, what well, we call them off-target effects. So we know they work, how they work to lower the, the lipids. They haven't been studied in other contexts and that's the best mm -hmm. answer I can give you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go back to Quant. Um, Clark, do you have a question? Yeah, I, uh, I just wondered about uh, Dr. Collier's opinion on this. I, I have found that uh, in the sense of getting information relative to medications that uh, quite often we overlook the role of pharmacists. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, granted, some of them are very busy trying to run a store, which is, uh, you know, which is a shame because it's a big distraction from their, from their uh, capabilities, if you will. But uh, I have found that uh, quite often that's an overlooked source of information. Uh, yep. <laughs> so I, I quite often tell people, um, I ask them the question, who's the medical professional that you can go and see and have a consultation about your medications without an appointment? And only about 25 to 30% of people say, oh yeah, pharmacist. Um, we actually have a, um, a, a formalized program in BC called medication management. Um, and you can go and have a consult with the pharmacist and they will pull your file and then they start rationalizing the medications and quite often they'll find like, well, not, well, more often than you would like, they find strange things like your GP's prescribed a beta blocker for your heart problem and so did your cardiologist. And now you're suddenly having two and that's why you're tired all the time. So I agree, the role of the pharmacist is high. Um, they're more used to seeing lipid lowering drugs and beta blockers and heart, heart drugs and things. The oncology drugs are so powerful and they're so specific, um, they don't, they see them. But in terms of, of advising you, they may say, hey, this is a really high, you're on a really high dose, um, but they're not going to be as knowledgeable as they are for other types of medications. Does that make sense? Yes, very much so. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? <laughs> Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, so somebody made a comment about NSAIDs. Um, and that's a really hard one um, because uh, this, the type of um, syndrome that, that you have, we're reduced to really only using them. Um, there did used to be some uh, COX-2 specific. So NSAIDs hit two enzymes, COX-1 and COX-2. There used to be some COX-2 specific enzymes and there were less side effects yeah. from those, but they got taken off the market for causing uh, heart defects. Um, so back in the, like, the early 2000s, so um, I appreciate the comment, but I can't offer anything um, in terms of the insets and the interaction with the other drug. Um, anyone else? Uh, one last comment I wanted to add. Um, mm -hmm. I've been watching a lot of uh, uh, presentations by a guy called Dr. Klotz. He's out of uh, Ontario somewhere. And uh, he is a big supporter of using statins, uh, metformin, and vitamin D. Uh, there's lots of things online that say those uh, clinically don't work. But every time you talk to him and see his presentation, he seems to think taking those three drugs in combination can have a, quite a dramatic effect on prostate cancer at any stage. Um, so anyway, just uh, to let you know that uh, he's a big supporter of that. I, I would say um, a lot of people are big supporters of a lot of things and I'm a supporter of following the evidence. So if there's a clinical trial that says that works or if the American or the Canadian College of Oncologists has a position statement that says it works or the Canadian Medical Association, but if you have one person saying one thing, then you have to take that with a grain of salt. It doesn't mean they're wrong, but it doesn't mean they're right either. Um, and I give you hydroxychloroquine as an example. <laughs> hydroxychloroquine does not work against COVID. I was on the clinical um, the therapeutics working group for COVID for Canada Public Health Agency. I still am actually, we just don't meet regularly anymore because the molecules aren't coming through yet. And I have seen trial after trial after trial, they had to stop early because hydroxychloroquine was not helping with COVID. So, but some people just believe that. So it, people with strong opinions aren't necessarily wrong, but people, I, I think you should follow the evidence. And if, if you've got trial after trial after trial that is well controlled, they're conducted at places like, you know, Rochester does a lot of them. 
uh, the Mayo Clinic does, and you know, or they're conducted at places that are reputable. You know, at a certain point, you just have to say, I really wanted it to, but it doesn't. Um, but it doesn't mean that people with strong opinions are always wrong. I mean, sometimes they're the ones that push through to find the evidence. I think that's a great, great answer. <laughs> Can I make one last comment, please? Mm -hmm. um, years ago, when I first got onto this doggone journey, I did lots of investigating with Mayo Clinic and other uh, institutions, and uh, even a guy called Dr. Bell in, um, I think it was Ottawa University, was doing a lot of tests using viruses such as um, uh, measles, um, you name it, uh, Maraba virus, the whole shooting match. And at the time, he said there was significant evidence that the virus could attack a cancer cell, and that his premise was mm -hmm. that when a cancer cell develops, it loses its ability to fight off older diseases. Now, apparently that fell by the wayside and wasn't universally um, productive and didn't give the results they expected. So it was kind of dropped. But I just wanted to let you know that I did take numerous vaccinations. They did have a great effect on my PSA. They didn't make it go away, but they certainly lowered it to a very significant level for at least 18 months. Hmm. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually take that one on and say, there might be a mechanism there. Vaccinations are, are designed to prime your immune system. So they'll pull up all your natural antibodies. And for the last, well, apart from half an hour, for 45 minutes, I spent a lot of time telling you about engineered antibodies to get rid of cancer. So it's not even, it's not impossible. It's not even improbable that a recent vaccination pushes up your natural antibodies and that helps with your PSA. Is it a cure? No. But the same thing is so prednisone. You know, you're probably everybody here knows what prednisone is, right? It, it is a natural uh, immune suppressor, okay? And part of the reason you take it is when, when your immune system's out of control with some types of cancers, your body is attacking itself. The flip side of that are all these MABs, these monoclonal antibodies. We engineer them, like I said, going after stuff on tumors like a, like a machine gun. Where the mechanism could possibly be there, and I'm not saying it is or it isn't, but here's a piece of speculation. If your own natural immune system comes up, some of those antibodies, they're for other stuff but some of those antibodies might see the cancer stuff as well. So it's not impossible, it's not even improbable, but is it, is it a long-term Is it a long -term solution? No, like you shouldn't be going and getting like, I don't know, shingles vaccine or MMR or whatever every few months. So that's, that's a really <laughs> bad idea. Um, so, but, but if it happened and it worked that one time because you needed it, then there's no downside to that, right? The explanation I received from one of the uh, immunologists I know is that there may very well be common proteins on the cancer cells that are common to say shingles. And yeah. of course, when you put the uh, shingrix in your body, it looks at all them cancer cells and it flushes your blood out with all the bad guys, but they tend to come back again. And I'm not sure why is because maybe they can't get access to all of the cancer cells themselves. But the explanation I received at the time uh, really uh, had an awful lot of merit. The one the test that the Mayo Clinic was using, they were actually using live measles virus and apparently had quite a good response. And there's actually several webinars online where they actually produce some very uh, good cures, so they say, not for prostate cancer, but for other cancers, using uh, everything from a rabies virus to actually a live measles virus. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is way out on the edge, but like, like I said earlier, like way out on the edge is not always wrong. Um, and, but again, I don't think vaccinations are a viable long-term alternative. I think if they have short-term benefit, there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, constantly getting vaccinated is not a good idea. Um, um, Frank, you have a question? Well, since we're talking about uh, unusual drugs and things. Uh, I did find that Aldera seemed to drive my PSA down at one time. I don't know if you're familiar with that drug, but it's an immune modifier used for skin cancer. That's the and I've always thought that uh, somebody should be trying to figure out how to make that one work since it, uh, so when it was attacking my skin cancer, it seemed to drive my PSA down at the same time. So it's something to keep in the back of your mind, I guess, someday. Uh, so some of the new drugs that are coming through, um, like the DNA. This block, is an old drug. You know, but no, but uh, so they're not. Yep. Well, so they're not new. Like I, I didn't create them in a lab. What they do is they take something old and they repurpose it. 
Um, they're doing that with a lot of hepatitis C drugs for COVID right now, and it's not working. But um, the point I was going to make is um, that some of the original melanoma drugs, we thought they worked on one place and they did, but they worked in another place as well. And particularly for melanoma, it's immune suppression because um, there's a huge amount of immune involvement in the skin. It's an IgE response. Um, so that sounds very plausible to me. But again, like where is the clinical trial? Where is the in vitro or in vivo data? Like, um, but it's a, the mechanism there is plausible. And at least one of the drugs that I, I talked to you about as a new one coming down the track has previously been used for melanoma. Thank you. Really interesting. Um, does anybody else have anything? <laughs> okay, well, I'm just going to put this in the chat and I'm more than happy to answer questions. Um, be aware you might get what my students call Dr. Collier's mega males because I can't not fully explain things. And so I end up with like a screenful. Um, and I usually have links to wherever the latest information is as well. But um, if you want, you please feel welcome to email me. And, and um, I do tend to reply to people at all hours of the day and night though, because I'm a bit busy, but um, please, please do. Thank you so much for, for this and for offering to, to take further questions if anything comes up. Um, I know that the guys really appreciate it. And I certainly do too, you making yourself available today. Um, no worries. I have, if you want to know what I'm doing after this, I'm out to pick up poop and feed horses. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, guys. Um, if anybody wants to join any of our other um, speaker series meetings, um, you can check those out on prostatecancersupport.ca slash calendar, or just go to prostatecancersupport.ca and click on calendar at the top and um, you can find all the meetings there and a bunch um, across Canada. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great evening.